accepted us unto him, spared us, supported us, and brought us to this hour. Let us also ask him, the Lord our God, the good mighty, his holy day and all the days of our life. O Master, Lord God, the Almighty, the Father of our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ, we thank you for every condition concerning every condition and in every condition. For you have covered us, helped us, guarded us, accepted us unto you, spared us, supported us, and brought us to this hour. Therefore, we ask and entreat your goodness, O lover of mankind, to grant us to complete this holy day and all the days of our life, in all peace with your fear, all envy, all temptation, all the work of Satan, the counsel of wicked men and the rising up of enemies hidden and manifest. Take them away from us and from all your people and from this holy place that is yours. But those things which are good and profitable do provide for us. For it is you who have given us the authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and upon all the power of the enemy. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. By the grace, compassion, and love of mankind, of your only begotten Son, our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ, through whom the glory, the honor, the dominion, and the adoration are due unto you. With him and the Holy Spirit, the life giver, who is of one essence with you, now and at all times and unto the ages of all ages. Amen. Have mercy upon me, God, according to your great mercy, and according to the multitude of your compassions. Blot out my iniquities. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I am conscious of my iniquity and its sin is all times before me. Against, against you only have I have sinned and done evil before you, that you might be just in your sayings and might overcome when you are judged. For behold, I was conceived in iniquities, and in sins my mother conceived me. For behold, you have loved the truth. You have manifested to me the hidden and unrevealed things of your wisdom. You shall sprinkle me with your hyssop, and I shall be purified. You shall wash me, and I shall be made whiter than snow. You shall make me to hear gladness and joy. The humble bones shall rejoice. Turn away your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit in my inward parts. Do not cast me away from your face and do not remove your Holy Spirit from me. Give me the joy of your salvation. And uphold me with a directing spirit. Then I shall teach transgressors your ways and the ungodly men shall turn to you. Deliver me from blood, give over. God, God of my salvation, and my tongue shall rejoice in your righteousness. O Lord, you shall open my lips, and my mouth shall declare your praise. For if you desired sacrifice, I would have given it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. The sacrifice of God is a broken spirit. A broken and humble spirit God shall not despise. Do good, O Lord, in your good pleasure to Zion, and let the walls of Jerusalem be built. And you shall be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness, offering and burnt sacrifices. And they shall offer calves upon your altar. Hallelujah. The sunset prayer of the blessed day we offer to Christ our King and our God, beseeching him to forgive us our sins. For the psalm, from the Psalms of the Father, David, the prophet, and the King, may his blessings be with us. Amen. All together. Praise the Lord, all nations. Let all people praise him. For him is established forever. Alleluia. Unto you lift my eyes, O you who dwell in heaven. Behold, as the eyes of servants are unto the and the eyes of the men servants mistress. So our eyes. Have mercy on us, O Lord, and our soul is exceedingly filled. Give reproach to those who prosper and give to the Lord. Holy Gospel according to St. Luke. May his blessings be with us. Amen. And he arose out of the synagogue and entered into Simon. House, and Simon's wife's mother was taken with a great fever, and they requested him concerning her. And he stood over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her. And immediately she arose and served them. When the sun was setting, all those who had any sick, any sick with diverse disease, diseases brought them unto him. And he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. And devils also came out of many, crying out and saying, You are Christ, the Son of God. And he, rebuking them, did not allow them to speak, for that they knew that he was Christ. And glory be to God forever. Amen.
All together, if the righteous on scarcely saved, where shall I, the sinner, appear? The burden and heat of the day I did not endure because of the weakness of my humanity. But, O oh, merciful God, count me with the fellows of the eleventh hour. For behold, in iniquities I was conceived, and in sins my mother bore me. Therefore, I do not dare lift up my eyes to heaven, but rather I rely on the abundance of your mercy and love for mankind, crying out and saying, God, forgive me, a sinner, and have mercy on me. Hasten, O Savior, to open to me the fatherly bosoms, for I wasted my life in pleasures and lusts. The day has passed me and me and vanished. Therefore, now I rely on the richness of your ever-ending compassion. So then do not forsake the submissive heart, which is in need of your mercy. For unto you I cry, O Lord, humbly, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. So make me as one of your hired servants. Every iniquity I did with prudence and activity, and every sin I committed with eagerness and diligence, and of all torment and judgment I am worthy. Therefore prepare for me the ways of repentance. O Lady of the Virgin, for you too I have appeal, and through you I seek intercession, and upon you I call to help me, lest I might be put to shame. And when my soul departs my body, attend to me, and defeat the conspiracies of the enemies. Shut the gates of Hades, lest they might swallow my soul, O you blameless bride of the true bridegroom. Lord, hear us and have mercy on us and forgive us our sins. Kyrie eleison, Kyrie eleison, Kyrie eleison. Kyrie eleison, Kyrie eleison, Kyrie eleison. Kyrie eleison, Kyrie eleison, Kyrie eleison. Holy, 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 O Lord of hosts, heaven and earth are full of your glory and honor. Have mercy on us, O God, the Father of the Almighty. Have mercy on us, Hosts be with us, for we have no helper in our hardships and tribulations but you. Absolve, forgive, and remit, O God, our transgressions, those which you have committed willingly and those which you have committed unknowingly, those which you have committed knowingly and those which you have committed unknowingly. The hidden and manifest, O Lord, forgive us for the sake of your holy name, which is called upon us. Let it be according to your mercy, O Lord, and not according to our sins. Lord, uh, make us worthy to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. A kingdom come, that will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation. Deliver us from evil. In Christ Jesus, our Lord, and amen. All together, we thank you, O compassionate King, for you have granted us to pass this day in peace and brought us to the evening thankfully and made us worthy to behold daylight until evening. Lord, accept our glorification with offered you and save us from the trickeries of the adversary, and abolish all the snares which are set against us. Grant us in this coming night peace without pain, anxiety, or unrest, or illusion, so that we may pass this long peace. And thus at all times and everywhere, we glorify your holy name, rather the Father and the incomprehensible, the meaning, and the Holy Spirit, the life giver. So 
Have mercy on us, O God, and have mercy on us. With all times and every hour, in heaven and earth. Worshipped and glorified. Christ our God, the good, the long suffering, the abundant in mercy, and the great in compassion, who loves the righteous and has mercy on the sinners of whom I am chief. Cleanse our bodies, conduct our thoughts, purify our intentions, heal us our Jesus, give us our sins, deliver us from every evil, stress our heart, surround us by your love. Lord, make us worthy to pray, thankfully. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, to the worship. Christ Jesus, our Lord. <clears throat> power and the glory are yours now and forever. Okay. Okay. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming. It's nice to see some new faces and some older faces. Um, oops, I have to be in the middle. Uh, I'm Sharif, and I'm happy to uh, join you today. Um, welcome, and thank you for joining us. And as we kick off this year's Lenten lecture series, we will have four lectures, Mondays and Thursdays. So every Monday and Thursday for the next two weeks, uh, we'll be having the, the Lenten Lecture Series, and this year's theme is the Stories of Transformation. Stories of Transformation. And to kick off our Lenten Lecture Series, I'm happy to welcome my friend, Monica, Monica Mina. Uh, she's going to come up to here today and talk to us about seeking conversion. Monica? Hello, welcome. Thank you guys for joining us tonight. Um, I'll do my best to keep this light and painless uh, for all of us here. Um, hopefully with a few layers of humor and sass that will be appreciated by some, not all. Um, I'd like to save questions for the end, if that's okay with everybody. There will be a mentee available for you to post your questions. Um, it just helps prevent me from going off on tangents, which I do often. Um, so I'll just keep our talk organized, but I'm happy to take any at the end as well. So hold on to them, please. Um, as Sharif mentioned, my name is Monica. Um, actually, I'm really excited to do a Lenten topic. I've been wanting to do one for many years, so this is my opportunity. Um, thankfully, too, the only week I was available, so it all worked out through the grace of God. So. Um, I'm very excited to go through this today, um, and I learned a lot while preparing this lesson, and hopefully you guys will take away a little something from this as well as we also enter um, Holy Week in a few weeks and getting ready for some of the other talks that you'll be hearing over the next couple of weeks as well. Um, what I really wanted to do today was first actually talk a little bit about what conversion, what transformation, what is actually taking place um, when someone experiences this. Because I think we hear a lot of these stories like the Samaritan woman, um, the jailer Philippa, there's many, many, many stories. Um, Moses the Strong, we hear about they live their life one way, they experienced a change or they experienced God, and then they became one other way. So what is that process? Like what actually happens to us? What do we actually go through? What do we actually feel? How does he try to speak to us in those instances to get us to have these revelations? Um, it's safe to say that we're all born good because we're created by him. Is that a safe statement to say? Nod your head if yes, shake your head if no, show me signs of life. It's theologically sound. Okay, yeah, I was afraid to ask this question because I felt like it would go in this direction. But in theory, 
We're all good because we were created by something good. He's more than good, but for the sake of this conversation, I'm going to use simple language. So we're all born good because we're made by him with good intentions. If we're all born good, what changes that? Rhetorical question, don't answer. Um, not ready for what's to come, <laughs> if you do answer out loud. Um, but if, if we are all born good, something changes that, right? There's, there's something that takes us away from that good into not good. I won't label it evil. I won't able, label it sinful. I will just say it is taking it away from good. Everyone will discuss in the next couple of weeks um, will have experienced this change. Um, there are many examples of people who have experienced going from good to not good, and those who have experienced going from not good into good, right? So the reverse of that. Uh, what I want everyone to keep in mind is that he's playing an active part in all of this, uh, in the transformation, in the conversion. He is providing guidance on how to remain good, not to go off course from being good, and how to go back to being good after going off course. So what this topic is going to be is a conversation just about that, the tools of conversion, what it takes to transform and change, um, and the enemy's role in all of this in trying to rattle us um, away from this good path that we're all on. What this topic is not going to be about is a conversation around God's will. I just will preface that God is involved in all of this. It is his will one way or another. He's not a micromanager. He is present in all of this. There is an intention behind all of this, but I will not get into the details of was it his will for him to do this and persecute all of the Christians. And, you know, I'm sure he played a part in all of that, but that won't be the discussion today. Uh, so I think I've mentioned a few precursory words that I'm going to be using throughout this. Transformation, change, conversion. All three of these words, interchangeable. I'm not going to get into, into the semantics of language because I actually can't. I will just tell you what I've learned after a lot of Googling, is that a lot of these words will flip-flop. You'll see change, you'll see transformation, you'll see conversion. Um, you'll also see other definitions about the religious connotation that this has. You convert from one religion to another. So for the sake of this discussion, I'm going to use those interchangeably. Um, so it's clear that whenever I do mention one of them, they're all one and the same. So when I was thinking about this subject, at first, I was like, oh, let me find a really good story about someone in the Bible or someone in history that maybe we haven't talked about and talk about, you know, how they transformed. Which is wonderful, um, but I struggled with that because every story that I read, I was like, it wasn't so clear to me, like, what changed them, right? I, I just felt like, oh, wonderful, they were, he was persecuting Christians and then, like, saw Christ and then he stopped. But what was involved in that? There were extra layers that played a contributing factor to that. So I took a huge step back. Um, and I wanted to think about conversion that, or a change or transformation that would be applicable to all of us. Is it fair to say that to understand how something changed, it's probably really important to understand what the origin of this thing was, or what the origin of this person was supposed to be, and the purpose they were supposed to serve, right? So I had to take that far of a step back. I had to say, if we're really talking about conversion and transformation and change, you know, they went from one thing to another, why did they do that? What were they supposed to look like before? How were they supposed to behave before? How were we supposed to act before? What was our purpose before? What was their purpose before? they transformed into this thing they were not supposed to be. So I'm going to take a very rudimentary example. Ride this train with me. Let's all take it together. Um, I thought of an example of a butterfly. Butterfly was a perfect, like very basic, natural concept. 
a butterfly goes through three changes throughout its entire lifetime. Back to elementary biology, it starts off as an egg on a, on a plant, and then it goes from the egg into a caterpillar form, and then it goes into the caterpillar form into the um, pupa, the transition stage, it's in a chrysalis, and it's about to morph into its final stage, which is the butterfly which is what we all know it as. And I'm sure I have like a really nice slide to go with this. It was all somewhere here. OK, here we go. So if anybody's wondering, this is what I'm talking about. Um, I should have mentioned in the beginning, too. I have slides. I, I might go off course. Sorry, Dina, who worked so hard to prepare them for me. But once again, this is why I'm not taking questions right now, because <laughs> it's going to be a lot for me to take in. Um, it goes through many, many stages before we see it as this butterfly, right? If you know anything about butterflies, which I don't expect anyone here to, but I'm going to tell you, and we're all going to be experts by the end of this, they're very similar to bees, so they're very, very critical in the, like, in terms of the ecosystem and the environment, right? They reach this prime state of being a butterfly. They don't go back to being a caterpillar. Their main purpose in life is to grow into this form and sustain our environment. Actually, butterflies account for a third of the food that we eat, so a third of the food that humankind consumes is pollinated and, and uh, basically cared for by butterflies. They maintain their environment by killing off certain species and bugs that are actually detrimental to our plants and our life. Um, they typically only live a few weeks to about a month. So they're very, very short, short time. What did you say? In the what a waste. What a wa <laughs> right, you would think it's a waste, but in these three weeks to a month, they're providing so much sustenance and so much life to us, the larger creatures. They're actually, their importance in nature is so much more beyond that. As butterflies, biologists actually use them to measure changes in the environment and ecosystem based on their population growth and decrease. So their entire life is meant to be lived as a butterfly, to sustain us, to carry us, to maintain an ecosystem. They're never meant to go back to being a caterpillar. They can't. They actually physically can't, and they never should, because the caterpillar is not what our environment needs. It's not what we need as humans to live. Their purpose is very clear. Their stages of life are very clear. But what's our shape? What's our origin? What's our purpose? What's our cycle? Again, rhetorical. Um, think about that for a moment. Because we go through a lot of motions, we go through a lot of different things day to day that detract from the origin, the purpose, and the shape that we're supposed to take. Four things to keep in mind. Our purpose, our shape, our being is created by him, in his image and likeness, for him, and to seek him. By him, in his image and likeness, for him, to seek him. Ephesians 2.10, for we are his workmanship created in Jesus Christ for good works, which God prepared beforehand that sh we should walk in them by him. Genesis 1.26 and 27, then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. In his image and likeness. For him. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? 1 Corinthians 6.19 and lastly, to seek him. I love those who love me, and those who seek me diligently will find me. Proverbs 8.17. So we're created by him, in his image and likeness, 
for him to seek him. Very clear. And this is one of, I feel like, hundreds of verses in these four points that you can find to support this. If I understand where I came from, who I'm supposed to be, what I'm supposed to look like, what my purpose is supposed to be, it's going to be a lot easier to understand when I've gone off track. It's going to be a lot more obvious as a being, as a person, to understand that I'm not doing what I'm intended to do, and it becomes a trickle effect. God has not left us to our own devices to just figure this out and say, good luck. Here's a couple of words from the Bible. Here's a few parameters. Say this prayer once an hour every hour, and you'll be good. There's a lot more guidance, and he was very diligent in what we should be mindful of and what we should be paying attention to up internally and externally that could rattle this. The two things I really want to think about today are the heart and the mind. I don't know how many times heart and mind is mentioned in the Bible. I probably should have looked it up. I probably would have found like 80 versions of that number. But in general, there's quite a few references of heart and mind. Marette, I said no questions if you're about to ask me a question. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I saw you looking at me. I was like, I'm not ready. I'm not ready. Um, the heart and mind. In summer, Matthew 22, 37 to 40, and he said to him, you shall, lo you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. Plain and simple, we know. This is the first one. Second one, love your neighbor as yourself. Not the subject for today, but good to also remember as you go through this. Um, very clear. You love him with all your heart, mind, and soul. You're set. It's the greatest and first commandment always given to us. They're given for a reason. These are two tools given to us for a reason to maintain our being. Matthew 6, 21, for where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. Also, once again, countless references. I urge everyone as we go through this Lenten season and entering Holy Week, there's a lot of beauty behind understanding what this treasure is, what waits for us creating treasures in heaven. Um, he is very, very, very clear that if your heart is set on the kingdom, if your heart is set on the treasure above that is promised, your body and your life will be set aright. Always something to keep in mind in life in general and especially during this beautiful Lenten season. Mind, set your mind on things above, not on things on earth. Very simple, Colossians 3.2. Very clear. Set once again, setting heart and mind on things above. It's all about redirecting heart and mind above. Now we're going to get some good stuff. So, when the heart and mind are distracted, this is when the enemy makes his way right? This is when the distraction comes in. This is when the course gets thrown off. It's important to understand, yes, you're, you're in control of your heart and mind and sustaining that and using that to your fullest ability and your fullest power. But it's also equally important to understand the enemy who pulls us off course. And he's got many tactics and many ways that are pretty tried and true and it's I think very easy to spot sometimes um, if once again we understand origin, purpose, intentions. A few things. He will distract you from your identity. So we're talking a lot about identity, origin, purpose, what we're supposed to look like. He's going to try to confuse who you are and make you think you're someone else. He'll convince you that whatever you're doing, don't do it. Do this instead. You've gone to church enough this week. You're going to go again? I think you've done your part. Little foxes like this. He'll confuse what it is that you're supposed to be practicing and what you're supposed to be doing. He'll cause you to question. An unhealthy question. Because I don't think it's bad to question 
why we do certain things, what are certain practices, but it'll cause you to really question why it is that you choose to do this and whether or not it's valuable. I'm going to use Paul as an example, formerly Saul. Um, he got, it's like the ultimate identity crisis, identity shift, right? The Saul to Paul is night and day. I think we all are, are very familiar with the story. Um, if not, you'll have to give me a minute to look it up and read you fuller verses because I didn't put it here, so apologies on that. Uh, but there are two verses that really stuck out to me um, in Acts when uh, talking about Paul's story. He's, we know him as Saul, Saul. Why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus whom you are persecuting, he replied. This is the moment right before he even realized who it was that he was hurting. This was the person before, persecuting Christ. The flip side is when he changed. But all that heard him were amazed and said, It is not he that, is it not, is this not he that destroyed them which called on this name in Jerusalem and came hither for that intent that he might bring them bound unto the chief priests. They were amazed. Is this the same person that persecuted us? He will confuse you. He will hinder your identity to an extreme like this or maybe those little foxes that I mentioned. He will try to speed you up or slow you down. Try to trip you in your spiritual life and what you're doing and this momentum that you're carrying. Holy Week, danger zone, right? It's like all Christians unite. This is like he hates this time, right? This is his chance to like flip-flap rattle. We're so close to finishing. Just have that piece of chicken. It's okay. It's like not a big deal. Like whatever. It's just a few more days. It's like, once again, those little foxes. There's an optimal speed where we praise and we preach the Lord. Everyone in this room is different, right? My pace is different than your pace, is different than your pace. We are not the same in the way we choose to praise and the way we choose to track our spiritual life. He'll either ex try to accelerate that till it crashes or slow it down if you're on a momentum. And those are things to be watchful for. Uh, an example, wonderful example of this is Paul's letter to Galatians in chapter 5. Uh, he's urging the Galatians at this point to follow the Christian teachings. Um, it's basically an illustration of the journey that the Galatians are taking. They were, they received the good news with great joy. They believed in Jesus, um, that he died on the sins for their, he died on the cross for their sins. They were welcomed into the faith. They received the Holy Spirit. They were following Christ. And then they crashed. He says, you ran well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? The persuasion does not come from him who calls you. Galatians 5, 7, and 8. The persuasion does not come from him who calls you. He clearly says that you were running well, you were doing well, what caused you to trip, what caused you to fall. The speeding up and the slowing down. The last one, which is the most eye-opening for me personally, is um, presenting you with a counterfeit. This one was the most rattling to me. Sometimes the enemy will surround you with people you might think are guides, people you might think are helping this course and helping this purpose and aiding this identity, but they're counterfeits. They start off with pure intentions. Everything is always masked in good intentions and originally. And this is the little foxes again. It grows gradually until it feels like this is correct. Yeah, we go to church on Sunday, 
But I don't know. For some reason, like, we're always going out, like, Thursday to Saturday night and, you know, like, coming in late on Monday. And, oh, we still go to church, but, like, we're, you know, we stay out a little late. The little foxes. That reel us in. It's the couple of nights a week. It's the every day a week. And then it's next we skip church. That's just, like, a very poor example. It's like a Sunday school example, but it gets the message across. Um, better examples welcomed, but at the end. Um, I think the Galatians 5, 7, 8 um, example also works really well here. Uh, the persuasion does not come from him who calls you. This is an example of the distraction, the counterfeit, um, the speeding up, slowing down. There's things in the Galatians way that's not meant to be there, that he's put there as distractions from the ultimate praise and preach of Christ. So how do I get out? How do we avoid the counterfeits? How do we slow down or speed up or avoid this race altogether? Or how do I stick to my identity? Three things. First one, for you to be able to take back your heart and mind, is do not default. Um, some of the stuff that I had pulled today, quite a, a number of it, I actually should accredit to um, Abuna Anthony from Canada. He, we were just at a retreat two weeks ago at this point, or maybe last week. The days were fuzzy. Um, and he gave this one, several wonderful examples, this being one of them. Um, when you first buy a phone, it's on default settings. It's not customized to you. It's not customized to your habits. Let's say if you need it on loud because you can't hear so well or you need to like make the font a lot smaller because larger font hurts your eyes. Um, you need to turn off sounds because you're sensitive to it. The, the device is not ready for your use. It's on default. I highly doubt anybody picks up an iPhone and is like, this is perfect right out of the box. Probably not, right? Don't default into this state. Sometimes we fall into this like standard state with no custom settings, no extra layers of prayer, no extra time reading the Agbeya, no time spent in the Bible. We go to this, I went to church on Sunday, I took communion. Check. There's no extra layer of customization to our spiritual life. Maybe I need to listen to a podcast every day to keep me in check with reading the Bible. Maybe I need to attend Tazbaha to ensure that I've received my spiritual nourishment before Sunday. This extra layer that's custom to your spiritual growth goes amiss. Do not default. Be wary of routine and being lukewarm as well. Um, you have to be continuous in the pursuit and active in this customization. Second one is to look back carefully. Looking back is to learn not to make those mistakes again. I think it's very easy for us to hear some of these stories like the Samaritan woman and, and her transformation or, or even Saul to Paul, right? It's very easy for Paul to probably beat himself up day to day, day in and day out, which I'm sure internally there might have been some sort of battle that he was going through, but it's very easy to beat yourself up, to say, like, who am I? This is the sin that I lived. It's going to follow me the rest of my life. Very easy. Um, once again, wonderful example I have to attribute to Buna. Um, when we ask, like, how do you look back? without falling back. He said, compare it to driving a car. So when you're driving a car, you always have to look in front. But if you only look in front and don't look behind you, what happens? If you don't check out the rear view mirrors or the back mirror? Head mirror? What's this mirror? Rear view, rear view thank you. Um, what happens if you don't look in those? You're at risk of probably not seeing the car as you're switching into a right lane or into a left lane. Right? You have to look back to make sure you're going the right way forward. But looking back does not mean going back. So look back cautiously to be able to take and to learn from those things and move forward. 
to get to your next de destination. Lastly, I'll end on this. As I said, I will keep it light and painless today. Um, might seem and feel like a little bit of a Sunday school ending, but it really is the, um, it's what drove this home for me, which is always giving God authority over everything I do. If he has authority over my identity, if he has authority over my actions, if he has authority over my thoughts, if he has authority over my course, and is a driving factor behind all of that, it's hard to go astray. And a lot of the stories that you'll hear, as soon as the course was found, yes, it was very difficult to maintain it, but it was very clear that if they gave God the authority, if they allotted him that, he took it. And he ran with it. So it's really important to keep that in mind that we are not doing this alone. Giving him the authority over it all helps us preserve our identity, our origin, and makes it crystal clear um, when things have gone astray. So I just wanted to share these couple of points. I know I didn't get into like a full-blown story of somebody who had experienced a conversion, but Everyone we'll talk about has experienced a change of heart, a change of mind, a change of pursuit on what their focus was and what was once important to them became less important when they understood what it was that they needed to pursue. I'll end with, because um, we just read The Samaritan Woman not too long ago. It's beautiful. The end of that is, um, let me pull that reference. I have the whole chapter here somewhere, but of course I can't find it. One second. At the end, um, he says to her, Jesus said to her, I made it a joke, no, sorry. Um, in verse 10, he says, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. If you know who it is you seek, and where your intentions are supposed to lie, it will, very easy, it will be very easy to go back constantly and realign with him. And glory be to God forever. Amen. Um, I didn't use any of these. I'm so sorry. Uh, da -da -da, distracted. It's important to know the enemy. Yes, we did this. Sorry. Just got into it. OK, questions? No questions? That's also OK. <laughs> Questions already, but um, please that. use the mentee here to ask more questions. So the first one, thank you, Monica. That was very nice. You're welcome. Um, how would you suggest we, ident we identify the little foxes and counterfeits in my life, and then removing them, especially if they are someone very close to you? Um, wow. Well. <laughs> Did you guys hear that? Yes. <laughs> Oops. All of Facebook heard it. Uh, oops. Um, someone once shared with me, and I, I, I say this repeatedly, and I, I, don't, I don't know where the origin of this conversation came with when this person shared with me or what it was, but um, if it takes me away from God, it is not for me. And that's just what I live by. It's very simple. Once again, maybe a very Sunday school answer, but if it pulls me away from what I know is right, we all know in the back of our mind what is right. If it pulls me away, it's likely a counterfeit. Remember, there's a course that we're following. There's a path that we're taking. There's an identity that we're assigned by him, in his image and likeness, for him, to seek him. If I'm not doing those four things, if I'm not living those four ways, then whatever it is that is I'm in that I'm questioning is likely a counterfeit. Okay, another question. What if I struggle with identifying the things in my life that I need to remove or change in order to, to correct the course? 
Is it that you're struggling? I'm wondering, there's like two parts to this, right? Is it that I'm struggling to identify them? Like I don't know that they are there or it's really masking itself so well? I guess, I, I mean, I, I would probably answer similarly along the first line, which is um, if you're struggling with something, if you're struggling with identifying, always go back to is it taking away or is it pulling me closer? If it's pulling away, then it's likely a counterfeit. And I know it hurts sometimes because a lot of these counterfeits end up becoming best friends, partners, um, people really close to us that we don't want to admit may be counterfeits. Um, but if you anchor it in Am I living in his image? Am I living for him? Am I constantly seeking him? Is my body and my mind not of my own but of his? If you can answer those confidently and say yes, then okay. I think you're okay. Um, if not, then it's time to really examine what it is that's fluttering the way. Yeah, the last point that I made. Give God authority over everything. There's plenty more. Oh my God. This is so painful. How do you get rid of foxes? <laughs> you set a trap. Somebody said it. Um, it depends what the fox is. The reason I say little foxes is because we had a Lenten lecture series about it a few years ago. Um, little tiny things that may not seem like anything until they grow into lions, right? Uh, not that a fox grows into a lion, because biologically not making sense, but um, for the sake of this analogy, it's like a starts off as a cub, it's really cute, you can probably think it's a kitten, and then it grows into a wild lion that eats you. Um, how do I get rid of them? Yeah. Depends on what the fox is. Oh, Uncle Samir, please answer this. Thank you. I think one of the best ways to get rid of foxes is to get closer to God. So instead of concentrating on the fox, concentrate on getting closer to God. And the foxes are going to go automatically away. I, mean, I think that's our problem, that we focus too much on the foxes, how to get rid of it. How to get rid of the foxes, get closer to God. So concentrate on getting closer to God and this mm -hmm. helps all you. So for the stream at home, if you haven't heard, um, Uncle Samir said um, basically to get rid of the fo foxes is to focus on God. I think our focus a lot of the time ends up being on the foxes and, and those things around us, but in, in essence it should be the focus on him and looking towards him, and he will provide that answer. Okay, along those lines, and I think it was asked before, but I'm going to ask it again. What, are, what is there... What are these counterfeit people? What if those counterfeit people are your family members? How do, how do you deal with family members kind of getting you away from? Well, <laughs> I am not qualified to answer this, so I will ask for a little help. Um, how, I think we, we're all a community. We're all in this together. It's not like singular salvation train coming right up. I'm on by myself. Um, we all have an obligation as one body to bring each other to salvation, to bring each other up and out of things. This family member, this person that may be hindering me, I don't understand, once again, the dynamics of this question in terms of like the granular detail, but empathy is really important. What is this person going through? What is this family member experiencing? What is making them behave this way? What is making them act this way? Why are they reflecting that on me? Two, boundaries are really important. Boundaries are critical. Um, we are one body. We are one in the same in terms of we share communion, we share the gifts of baptism and Mayroon. Um, 
But a boundary is incredibly important when it comes to maintaining your spiritual sanity and your spiritual identity. Um, so it is personal, a boundary is personal, but I will tie it again back to our focus is on Christ, not the fox, not the family member. Prayers are on the family member. Teaching the family member or the friend or whoever it is through actions and through scripture on us, sure. But as soon as the weight becomes too heavy to bear and it veers, it's time to re-examine your personal boundary. And I can't tell you what that is other than if it's not looking towards Christ and it's pulling you away, time to examine. Okay, another question. Can you be a counterfeit to your friends and not even know it? Yeah. How would you know if you're a counterfeit to your friends? I don't know. But, I mean, we're not all excused of this, right? Like, we all... We're not all perfect. We're not all perfect. I don't know what we would look like. I don't know. I'm sure I, I'm not perfect. I'm sure I've brought somebody down. I'm sure I've convinced somebody not to go to liturgy on Sunday or so let's skip to Zebeha and go to dinner. Or, I'm sure. Um, but I, you know this because you know what you're supposed to do. If you know what you're supposed to do, you'll know if you present someone with the option of something they shouldn't be doing. You can ask them, but if they don't know what's going on and you don't know what's going on, like, what? It's like the blind leading the blind, like, salvation train, get off, like, it's. Okay, last question. Thank God. <laughs> in, the, in the secular world, mm. if we only. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I, I, love, I love the secular questions, here we go. Yeah. <laughs> We are in the secular okay. In the secular world, if we only live by those standards, what we, standards? The one you su subscribe to. Okay. <laughs> um, subscribe now. <laughs> Listen in. Okay. Will we isolate ourselves and limit what we can achieve? We saved the toughest question for last. Wow. Thanks. Can you repeat it one more time? Sure. In a secular world, if we only live by those standards, will we isolate ourselves and limit what we can achieve? I'm assuming is what achieving, I can, achieving a worldly life. Is what I can achieve here greater than the treasure that waits for me above? Is, is anything I do here, if, we're, if the question is geared towards limit me and what I can do secularly, whether that be a promotion or do this or that or, I don't know, name a secular item of choice, um, is any of that amountable to what's waiting as a treasure above? I think one of my points was part of our identity and who we are is to seek. What am I seeking? Great. Thank you, Monica. You're welcome. Dina's going to come for her. Thank you, Monica. Great talk. And thank you for reminding us that we are created by him in his life, in his image, in his likeness, and for him, and to love and seek him. That is a great reminder. Um, welcome, everybody. We are so happy to see a lot of familiar faces and a lot of new faces. So we're happy that you're here and joining us. Um, actually, uh, we um, make sure that you follow us on our social media. We have SMSM NYC on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and on YouTube. Um, if you haven't joined our mailing list, please do so. Um, you can join us on smsmnyc.com. And um, it's a great idea because that way you can receive our announcements and you can also know, um, uh, get the emails about everything that's happening in the church. Um, this week, we are not going to have a liturgy on Wednesday, but we will have a liturgy on Thursday. 
Um, it will be Thursday morning at 8.30, and it is, uh, we will be celebrating the Feast of Annunciation. And um, on Thursday also, it will be our second Lenten lecture series with Father Carolus Ibrahim from the Diocese of, Diocese of LA and Southern California and Hawaii. And he will be speaking to us on conversion transformed by mercy. Saturday, we have a liturgy in the morning and Madden's will start at 8.30 as well. Um, and on Saturday, we will have Vespers at five o'clock, not at our normal time, seven. So make sure that you're here. We're gonna have Vespers and um, Midnight Praises. Sunday, our normal liturgy is at 8.30 and um, we start Madden's and then we follow, uh, followed by the liturgy. Um, remember to use Amazon Smile so you can give back to the church. And you can always donate to our beloved church. You can find all the links on our website and also on our social media. Thank you, everybody, for coming in. And it was so good to see you all. Well, he's not here. Is it? Okay. Just in time for prayer, but come and pray for us. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Okay, stand up for prayer, please. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Through the intercessions of the Theotokos, St. Mary, Grant us the forgiveness of our sins. We worship you, O Christ, with your good Father. Holy Spirit, for you have come and saved us. A mercy of peace. A sacrifice of, of praise. O oh Lord, make us worthy to pray. Thankfully, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. To temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Christ Jesus, our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory for every man. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. The love of God the Father, the grace of his only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the fellowship and the gift of the Holy Spirit be with you all. You may go in peace. The peace of the Lord be with you all.